Good evening, folks, and welcome to Be Brown Bag, the weekly IT video podcast where we are going to talk about all things IT from cloud to DevOps. Tonight, we are going to be talking with Dwayne McDaniel about demystifying Git. Dwayne's been working as a developer. So, welcome, Dwayne. Hey, welcome. Thank you very much for having me. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you for, for, for jumping on here and excited to talk to you about, about all things Git. So, um, so tonight, uh, Dwayne has been working as a developer relations professional since 2016 and has been involved in the wider tech community since 2005. He shares his knowledge by giving talks and has done over 100 events all around the world. Currently living in Chicago and outside of tech, Dwayne loves karaoke, seeing live music, and doing improv. Like improv cam comedy? Yeah. I live about two blocks from the Annoyance Theater. I was there last night. I'll be there tomorrow night. Uh, I love seeing it, love doing it. Um, teach, coach uh, on stage as much as I can. Uh, but I learned in San Francisco, started in about 2010. Uh, there I produced hun hundreds of shows, I guess, and was on stage about three nights a week for a giant chunk of my life. Uh, so yeah. I have so many more questions now. Wow. I yeah. I, I have a talk about improv <laughs> and development. We could switch over and do that one instead. <laughs> no, we'll save that for the next we'll save that for the next brown bag. This is going to be amazing. Uh, actually, I'm already booked for another brown bag. I'll be talking about um, uh, what Git metrics can tell you about your team. And that will be in <laughs> August. So we'll do it. We'll schedule another one. End of the year. End of the year blowout. <laughs> Amazing. I, I would also like to to give kudos to whoever it was that came up with the Git Kraken logo. That is my favorite logo. It is it is it's it's. A, I, I'm also an octopus aficionado. Hmm. Um, when it, when I scuba dive, my my sole goal is to find octopus and and film them as much as possible. So when I saw that, I was like, this this is going to be amazing. I can't wait. <laughs> uh, so the person who designed that um, is named Shane Reimer. Uh, uh -huh. And he is an awesome designer out there in the world. You can find him on uh, LinkedIn, Instagram. Is uh, he an employee of Get Kraken or is he was, an independent? Uh, was uh, that logo comes from 2016, 2017, before I joined the company. I hope uh, they never change it. It's, it is timeless and it is perfect. It kind of is. Nice. Well, um, so before we get going, a few of our regular housekeeping notes. Get in on the conversation. We'll be monitoring the Q&A thread for all of our live audience members. And you can also tweet to at the brown bag or hashtag the brown bag. And Chris and I will be monitoring the Twitter sphere throughout the course of the, the show. Um, you can follow Dwayne McDaniel at at McDwayne. Um, you can follow me uh, at Cloud Osmotic, but I don't really you know, I tweet about random things, so I'm not that exciting, but. I feel the same way about my, uh, actually my Instagram feed just kind of populates to Twitter. So you see a lot of things about improv and rock and roll in Chicago on my Twitter feed, just as a natural follow over. Very nice. Cool. And Chris, do you wanna? And uh, my name is Chris Williams. I am super boring, not into improv. Uh, however, I am into live music, and you can follow me at Mistwire on the on the Twitter sphere, but you shouldn't. Um, so, speaking of live music, Dwayne, last night we actually uh, went and saw Pucifer down in down in Boston. Sweet, and it was amazing. Oh wow! We, it, it is, it, they are such a good show. Yeah, they're coming to town. Uh, my friends have tickets. I do not at this point. But highly recommend you attend. If you if you're a Maynard James Keenan fan at all, because mm -hmm. of Tool or Perfect Circle or anything like that, uh, I saw who's... I saw Tool when they came through town in the United Center. That was an amazing show. It was back. It's 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 it, they have the. I mean, there is a Venn diagram of the of the of the people that go to the different kinds of shows and. I, I enjoy Tool and the other one, and, and Perfect Circle as well, but Pucifer has got this like really very, very cool vibe and the live show for it is very, um, not interactive, but a lot, there's a lot more than, than what they do in Tool with, all, with the, the curtains and everything. So highly recommended, two thumbs up. Um, yeah, that's Saturday actually, they're playing here in Chicago. Saturday, oh. July 2nd. I'm, I'm, so, I'm hoarse from shouting from last night. That's, that's how good of a time I had. 
<laughs> I might end up at that show. We'll see. If if you go, let me know what you what you think about it. Well, you'll see it on Twitter if I go for sure. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. All right. Well, let's let's give you the power so that we can uh, light this candle. I want to learn all about Git tonight. Oh, cool. So I should hit screen share. Uh, it says I can't share until. Sean, you have to relinquish the power. Don't you know how Zoom works? I'm uh... still learning myself. They. <laughs> I use Zoom every day, and I'm still figuring out where stuff is, and I still can't find the chat button half the time. So share screen, and it and it changes when you share screen, so it totally throws off my game too. And as soon as I shared screen, it moved all of your talking heads around. So now I'm staring off into space, <laughs> just trying to get Zoom to cooperate and go snap to the bottom of my screen. Why will you not do it? I keep snapping it back to the top of my screen for some reason. There. That's good. Now I can see y'all. Um, so, hey, everybody. Thanks for very much for having me. And we're going to try in the next you know, 50 minutes or so to demystify Git. It's a tool, like I think it's been said, everybody uses. 95 plus percent of developers on Earth use it. Um, but do you ask a lot of people how it works internally? It's fuzzy at best. <laughs> um, and that's what Hopefully we can talk about. It. So I already had an intro there, but I just like showing the Git Kraken logo again. Um, quick, Leo would just like to say what we do at Git Kraken, other than just have really cool logos and backgrounds. Shane also designed one behind me, um, meant to symbolize chains of, of commits. Um, oh, yeah. We make something called Git Kraken Client. It's a desktop app, cross um, cross OS. It works on all the Linux versions we know about, uh, as well as Mac and Windows. It actually is really awesome because you don't actually have to install Git to use Git crack and it uses uh, node Git under the covers to accomplish Git. So uh, it can be used in situations where you just can't install Git. Uh, main reason people love it is the visualization. And just real quick, this is what it looks like. Uh, you can quickly see where your branches are, uh, drag and drop things to make things happen. And you know, makes it a little bit easier to manage things a little bit easier because we have an undo button where you can literally undo stuff <laughs> instead of having to go through the command line to like revert or what have you. Um, we also make something called GitLens. It's a, a extension for VS Code. It's open source. It's free. There is a paid bonus set of features you can tap into if you want to, um, but uh, it's always going to be free and always going to be open source. It the main thing it's famous for is the line by line. Did I? I did pull it up. Uh, the line by, oh, it's not going to do it on that file. Of course not. Uh, but the line by line blame uh, that should be showing here. Here we go. So here you can see like who made a commit, how long ago, and then it's got some hover power to show you more information, including um, the commit. The If there's a PR involved, it will show you that stuff as well. Unlocks a lot of the power of Git inside of VS Code. And the last one, Git integration for Jira does exactly what it says on the box. If you're using Jira, it gives you a way to tie in your Git instances to Jira to like create branches and modify things and Git directly inside Jira. I'm not going to demo that one because well, I don't know. Not everybody uses Git or uses Jira. All right. So why really? did I make this session? Uh, yeah, I know. Not everyone in the world does, but people that do love it. Um, Who doesn't use Jira? I use it to wash dishes. Are you kidding me? <laughs> I, I, I you know. I, I surfed. Uh, I, I surfed. Never mind. I'm not going to make that joke. I was going to say, I <laughs> all the way across the Atlantic on Jira once. It doesn't make sense. Um, so why this session? Why did I put together a session about demystifying Git? Well, um, before I answer that question, I always like to put up this disclaimer. It's one of my favorite books ever in the whole life. Can't teach a kid to ride a bike at a seminar. I cannot teach you all of the internals of Git and demystify it completely 100% to everyone's satisfaction in the time I have. But I can send you in the right direction. That the very end of this, I will send you in the directions where I learned most of what I know from about Git. And the only way you're really going to learn it is to go explore it yourself, get the commands in your fingers, and start digging into it. So then why did I do this if I can't make you a Git master? Well, because we all use Git. And for most people, it just works out of the box as you expect to do these very specific things that we learn. There's the XKCD uh, comic that I did not put in this slide deck. It's like, here's like six commands to learn. If anything blows up, just blow out the repo, reclone it. And if that catches fire, call the one guy 
actually can understand any of this stuff. <laughs> that's pretty much true because sometimes you need to do things besides just that short list that you memorized and you get into weird places like detached head. Detached head in any other scenario is terrifying. That's not a thing you will ever want to encounter, a detached head. And get that's a superpower. That's one of the cool things about it. But at first, that's not obvious. Um, emerge conflicts, sad trombones of get. Um, really, we just get terrified as human beings of things we don't understand. Like, it's not really that scary, but we encounter these situations when we're trying to get stuff done and we're under deadlines, we're under pressure. It's like, okay, I just need to push this. And oh no, what happened? And now, now we got some bad stuff going on. And that's the scary part, not get screwing up on its own. Are you doing something slightly wrong? Um, there is a fun, I'll stop that for a second. Um, there's a story this week. Um, you can, uh, the maintainer of curl, released a blog post, I think Tuesday or maybe Monday. Um, he did a security fix, was pushing it to a security branch and then realized, uh-oh, I pushed this live. I pushed the security fix and exposed this vulnerability in my main branch. That's the, where the panic comes from. Not that pushing is hard or these steps are hard. It's like, I might do it wrong and it might put me in jeopardy. And honestly, it can seem like a dark art, it uses terms that no other technology uses. Uh, if you read the release notes, it literally says this command learned this concept. That's how they wrote it. It uses the, the ending ish, a bunch, a commit ish. It means anything that can eventually get to a commit. But what other language uses ish to describe sets of things? Mm -hmm. and things like RevParse picked out and massage parameters. What on earth does that even mean? It, it makes sense though, if you are one of these two guys and the other people that write Git. Um, let's never forget that Linus Torvald was managing patches over email and using literally the Linux, um, or using bash to diff things. That's where mm. Git diff comes from is just diff built into bash. Uh, and like, comparing things and applying patches and writing things like this is a pain let me just figure out a better way to do this three months later he hands over the project to junio who's still in charge of it today gitster uh he hasn't talked publicly since 2015 and the last interview i read from him, like 2018 but he is still active on the mail list and he is still pushing out releases to them it all makes sense because they understand pearl very deeply they can use said and awk with their eyes shut the good news is that we can all read the code. We can all get in there. It's open source. They were generous enough to at least give us that. Um, and we have the four freedoms with that, which means we can run it however we see fit. We can study how the program works. And that's the main point of the slide. Uh, we can redistribute copies. So if you want to make your own version of Git based on theirs, go for it. Nothing's stopping you. Uh, the problem is that it's mostly C code. I don't know about you, but C is kind of a weird language. Uh, it's hard to parse for me. Um, that's actually what checkout looks like. If you want to go dig into the code, that's fun. Um, other thing about Git that kind of makes it confusing to people is that there are certain concepts that we conceptualize one way because it's easy to explain it that way, but that's not actually how it works. Uh, but it's easier just not to correct people on that. Um, how Git deals with deltas and diffs works slightly differently than how I think most people conceive of it. And we'll get into that later. And then branching, um, I think it works differently than how I was taught with the more I dig into it. But again, we'll talk about that when we talk branching later. But really it's hard. And this is one of the bigger things is we all learn, oh, Git is a way to track code. Git's a way to track files. No, Git is a way to track the file system. How Git actually works is by taking snapshots of the file system. I'll I have slides about that later. Not individual files, not the differences between those files. It's making a record of what happened in that directory, when those things happened and who caused them to happen. Compressing that version of the file system down into something called a commit, a snapshot, and then moving on and doing it again over and over and over. You can build it yourself Somebody built it from C code. You could build this out of Perl or Bash. All you need is a compression 
uh, algorithm that can compress down the file system, a universal time tracking system, which we have access to. Uh, let me, I should have had it pulled up. Where is it? Uh, I have the app on my phone. I can tell you right now it is 1,656,549,999 seconds in Unix time. It's been counting up since uh, 1970 and every computer on earth leverages this. So we have a universal tracking system and we need a way to write down what's in those archives. And we can do that in text files. That's pretty straightforward. See, that's all you really need to do get. And that's kind of all Git really does. Everything else is just how to get at these systems and how to access all of that, that information. One of the other weird things in Git, um, I don't know if it's that weird, but it's that to get everything's local. There's no true like, real version of something. There is only a copy that it knows exists somewhere else, but Git is the stupid content tracker. That's if you type man git into a terminal, it literally tells you it's the stupid content tracker. It has no idea. What's the real version is something human beings decide on. That's GitHub um, ownership and those conversations that happen. To get everything's local to it. That's why we, when we think of terms like push and pull, those are always in relative point of view of Git. So what's that picture at the bottom? Um, I used to live about five blocks from that in Oakland. Gertrude Stein, the famous playwright, once said, the problem with Oakland, California, is there's no there there. So in the 70s, some artists put some there and a here in Oakland, so there officially is. <laughs> this is actually, I think, a pretty good way to talk about it, though, because to you, wherever you're sitting on Earth, you are here to you, and here and there are there. But if you were standing by here, then here would be here and there would be there. But if you were standing in front of there, then here would be there and here would be, there would be here. That's confusing on purpose, but that's kind of how we get in trouble with Git sometimes is we start confusing like, well, what's the real repo? Just step back. Where's the file system, the Git folder that I'm working in say here is, okay, that's true. We can go from there and it'll straighten a lot of problems out. Um, so what we're going to do next, let's take a look at Git internals. Specifically, we're going to look at the Git folder, not get the CLI program written in C that lives in your, somewhere on your machine that you installed, not in your user bin or on Windows, I don't even know where it would be, um, but somewhere um, on your machine. We're talking about what's actually in a project folder, Git, that actually manages what's going on with Git and your project. Uh, quick question, Sean, Chris, have you ever actually popped open the Git folder before? I have, I have cracked it open gotten scared and then ran away. That's, uh, <laughs> that's, that's basically my, my that, interaction with it. I have to I, write some hooks. Yeah. To, yeah. Uh, to write hook, put hooks in, but that's about it. I have, uh, taught Git to well over a thousand people and that's, that is the most common answer. Those are the two most common answers. Uh, hooks definitely is awesome. I don't really talk about it in this talk, but hooks are super power automation platform scripting that we're not going to get into today. Um, but the one file in there that I do want to draw your attention to is head. Head is 20 bytes big. Hmm. One of the most important pointers in all of computer science and Git is, is 20 characters big or about that size. And this is what it looks like. Head is simply a reference telling us in human readable terms where here is in Git's point of view at any given time. So where is head? It's simply here. All of those places it could point and what actual commits those line up to are all stored in that pack refs file. So you can easily see if you just look in it and I highly encourage if you're at home, open up a Git repo right now and like take a look and see like, oh, wow, that's there. Um, but references to what? What are these references to? I what I mentioned earlier, Git's taking these entire snapshots of your file system, whatever folder that that dot .git folder is in, that and recursively everything down, it's taking the snapshot of all of that. It's really smart about it though, because if a file doesn't change between versions, all it does is say, well, I'm gonna point back to the last version. That's that's the ver that's the true version. 
So it doesn't take a whole new snapshot there. Otherwise the project would grow exponentially every time you took a commit. Um, it's only packing a new version of whatever change. So in this case, C2 would have changed in version three or B1 and A2 would have changed in version four. So, so yeah, this that's always sort of like, that's definitely mystified me, right? When you're, when you're looking at your file system and you're working on some code and you change a branch, mm -hmm. the code changes, but even if you've committed like deletes or you've moved files, like those files will disappear out of the folder and reappear when you change back to the branch. Where is it storing? Like, how does that work? Where does that, where do they go? I am very glad you asked because that's literally what the next piece is. Um, so where are we doing with the commit? Um, so at, I'll, got it slightly out of order. I'll come back and answer that question, I promise. Let me get it through this order to make it a little, make a little more sense. And then if I haven't asked a question, come back. Oh, no, totally, totally. That's a great question though. And that's literally what this next section's about. I just couldn't remember what, there's a direct answer to that in one of the slides, but it's just not yet. So what's in a commit? What does that snapshot actually look like? Git makes these things called blobs, binary large objects. And that's the slide that's coming later, right? I'll break that down a little bit. That's the actual compressed down thing in binary. Uh, and all of those get checksummed. That list of those blobs get added to something called a tree. That is what the index file is. That's your index, that's your working tree. So whatever you git add, that's what git add looks like. Uh, this is the staging. So it takes those trees, which point to these blobs, and then at any point we can say, all right, we're gonna commit this, and that becomes a commit. All of these have their own checksum. All, it's checksums all the way down, compressed all the way down. At each level, you write slightly different information. The blob is literally the file compressed down as far as it can be compressed. The tree is the list of blobs plus some meta information. The commit is the tree information the compressed tree plus the author information who made that commit plus some other stuff. Hmm. Interesting. Git's not tracking diffs. This is one of those conceptually things that everyone kind of never really corrects anyone because, oh yeah, it's diffs. It's really lightweight. We're passing deltas. No, we're passing patches that modify that compression, compressed file system when you're, when you're moving things around. That's why we can move very lightweight objects that affect the repos and not the entire file every time oh. but it's not it's but it's tracking the complete compressed files every time that it's again the index looks like this it's not human readable that's why it's a big red blur you have to tell vs code to like please show me this and it's like i'll do my best what is human readable in here are the file names that it can't compress any further and still make sense of it later because we need those names to go to the tree to go to the commit. Mm -hmm. It stores those snapshots, binary large objects, which are referenced. That's where the term ref comes from. By a 40 character checksum. Originally with SHA-1, we're moving to SHA-256 SHA ah, SHA right now. They'll still be 40 characters. Not gonna get into all the politics, for lack of a better word, of that. But there is security needs there. Um, and you, two scientists one time proved uh, two different PDFs could have theoretically the same 40 character SHA. Um, in labs, they caused a collision and they were like, all right, we got to get rid of SHA-1. It's kind of like a side project. Or so, side so Graham has a question, if you don't mind, since we're on this yeah. topic, but if it's just patches, doesn't that make it fragile for file errors? Um, no. Uh, is the short answer to that <laughs> because well again you're not storing patches um you are storing the complete thing but then you're running a diff uh, this is why i didn't really include this here is is the search getting a little murky but then you're running a, a diff and you're passing that around and then that diff's getting applied it's uh, that patch is getting applied um because again remember where this came from this was linus torvald running diffs and applying them how do i do that more efficiently that's what this is on a, just a very compressed scale. Um, individual, oh yeah, that was the next part. 
um, individual objects. It's not storing like one thing, it's storing those snapshots over time. So if you look at your commit history and you go and look at your objects database in uh, in the Git folder, that's where this is located. It's uh, literally literally this. Um, it's two, two, where is it? My objects here. It's literally this, and I run a Git diff. Uh, not Git diff, a Git log. Uh, what am I doing? Git log one line. Um, I can find 81, 81, 81. Okay, that's the first two numbers, and there's the full SHA um, for that object. And now I want to open anyway. Yeah, I do want to open it. And that is what that object looks like in a compressed form. That's the actual binary for that commit. What's in that commit? Um, some testing I did in an example branch I was doing when I was making a Git bisect video. Can I just say that I, I, I really enjoy those law, uh, those commit messages? <laughs> uh, that was specifically forcing a weird little scenario for Git bisect, which I'll talk about later. Um, cool. So uh, for fragility, actually, I've never had that conversation about it before because it's just dang reliable. Um, it's applying text. Anyway, um, but as I said, it doesn't take a full blown every single file every single time because we benefit from the fact that chains are commits always point to their parent. So you can just reference like, yeah, it didn't change. It's just get it from the parent. Didn't change, you get it from the parent. Didn't change, get it from the parent. You can go do that all the way back to the beginning of time. It's like you could generate a readme in the very beginning of the project and you never, ever, ever, ever touch it for some reason. Yeah, you never make a new compression of it. You're just always pointing back eventually to that first commit. Because of this parentage, then we can really stack these things up and see our full history at any given time. And that's where our logs come from. So remember, we're still in the, the tour to get uh, uh, Git folder, tour to Git folder. Um, that's where our logs, uh, uh, logs come in. Our references give us ways to get back easily to see what we called or human readably called those commits. And that's what I just demoed over here is a git log uh, literally says, all right, here's what happened and here's the commit. If you need to get back to it, you can do something called a checkout to go get to those things. If you go dig through your logs file, um, you will see things that look like this, which will give you a starting ref, an ending ref, who did it, your email address. That's why you have to get config name and email to use Git, uh, Unix timestamp, UTC offset, based on where your computer is, and then what actually happened. Beginning, end. And you might notice right now, hey, wait a minute, some of those are the same. I'll get to that in a second. But that's how it's storing this internally. So when you're on Git log, it's literally looking up the list and saying, okay, that's presented to the screen. So it's not some magical format somewhere. It's just literally spitting text at you from, it's parsing text out of a file that's in the Git log file or Git folder. Uh, go and dig through it. There's no, you're not gonna break a Git folder by looking around in read-only files. Huh. I already gave it away there, but Git, doesn't just track your commits. Git actually tracks everything that happens. We choose when we say, all right, here are these points in time where we want to write down our name on the thing and say, officially, this is the commit. This is the state that we want to get back to as a human being. Thankfully, Git is really paranoid about losing stuff, at least for a little while. So it stores everything in ref log. Um, that log that we looked at, that is literally everything that happens. So if you run a git, uh, sorry, git ref log um, on your machine, it will say, all right, here is literally every single thing that you have done. This is when you changed branch. This is when you ran an undo. This is when you commit it. This is a uh, checkout. So commits are definitely in there. Oh no. It's going to find all the times I tried to add a git ignore and it failed. 
<laughs> but it's only there for a minimum of 30 days. Um, Git stores various things from like, depending on how you set it up from 30, 60 or 90 days, depending on what you're doing. Um, 30 days is the minimum you should have in your head. So if it's, oh no, I completely hosed the repo and I don't know how to get back. If it's been in the last 30 days that you hosed it, run a Git GC, figure out how many steps behind head you are. And then you can actually run a Git checkout head at how many steps back. And it will put it literally right back to that step. So if I wanted to like, all right, I did a rebase, but that didn't go well. Um, or I deleted his branch. I didn't really need to delete that branch because I was forcing a crash. Um, uh, but okay, I need to go back and say that state. Well, I can go back and hit that state. I can go back and because, again, we're not passing around diffs around, like, all right, get, put the file system back in the exact state it was, uncompress those files and make that reality again. It can do this for any commit. It can do this for any state in your ref log. But that's when we were going to run into detached head. Detached head simply means that you're not pointing at the tip of a branch. You're not pointing at the last commit in the chain. That's all it means. Uh, detached it means that you're no longer pointing at another pointer. You're pointing at directly a commit. I said the last commit in a branch. This is also one of those things that starts getting confusing because this is probably the most famous picture of a Git branching strategy on the internet. If you look up Git branching, this is one of the first three pictures you'll always see. Mm -hmm. uh, this is confusing and scary. I, it's not if you like really stare at it and all right, I can kind of see that workflow and like, okay, kind of, okay. But you have to already have that knowledge of like what tag means. Oh, man, I jumped too fast. All right, um, what really is happening there is that Git is uh, just writing down a list. Literally, to Git, it kind of looks like this to its internally. Like, here's the beginning ref, the parent ref, here's the ending ref, and here's a human readable pointer that we've called a human readable name that points to that reference. Hmm. So if head now points to this one, well, there's no pointer that points to it. We're in a detached head state now. When we check out feature branch three, now it's pointing at a pointer again. Hey, I'm no longer in a detached head state. Head's pointing at feature branch three. Literally the head of the branch, hence the word head. But you don't have to point it there. You can point it anywhere. And this, I realized, would be more confusing than this especially when you're getting started. Like, here's a laundry list of commit shahs that reference each other. To get though, they're all just stacked up like this. It's just a bunch of numbers in a list that it's like pointing around at and saying, okay, start, finish, start, finish, start, finish, start, finish. Human readable names. That's why merge and rebase are pretty straightforward concepts. Though to most people, rebase is terrifying and merge is simple. If you look from this list, yeah, merge is completely, or um, I can totally understand how rebase is, is baffling. Looking from this perspective, it's like, oh, wait a minute. I got slides for this. Um, merge is preserving those other commits that were in that list, those sets of refs. Rebase, literally just rewrites all of them into one line. So instead of having like, all right, here's this, uh, go back up to my thing here. All right, instead of uh, here is a base commit that feature one is based off of originally and now are moving up. If I wanted to merge head or hot fix, I'm sorry, got that backwards. I wanted to merge uh, feature one into hotfix. Cool. Now, what's ever in here gets combined with what's ever in here. We have a brand new commit, and that makes our merge. And all of this stuff stays left behind. We hmm. rebase feature branch into hotfix. 
Git says, all right, rewind, set reality back to the base commit, and let's replay every single one of these commits again. And what we'll end up with at the end of the day is something called hotfix, where feature one branch doesn't exist anymore, just the commits. So you're either preserving that history or you're rewriting it in a straight line. literally replaying them. Mm -hmm. Another way to look at it is like this, maybe a little simpler. Uh, and it's good to look at these things in different different lights in different ways. Uh, here, we've made our commits over here and now we've merged them and co commit three and commit four, hit commit five. This is literally straight out of the Git book. Um, that's why it still says master, uh, the pro Git book. Um, versus here where we had these two branches and said, all right, rebase. It's like, all right, rewind. What's the base I came from? Let's rewrite all of those changes all the way through. And now I'm in C4, but it's over here and I've included everything along that route. So it's also not destructive. Rebase should not be destroying the thing that it's rebasing through. So I guess I didn't misspeak earlier. We wouldn't end up just with a hot fix. Uh, hotfix would still be there, but we'd also have experiment re with that new direct line. So is rebasing sort of like squashing commits when you merge? Yes. Is In that fact, the same thing? Yes. Um, I'm very glad you asked that. Rebase, that that's one of the things you do in a rebase is you squash commits. That's you can it's it's your ticket into rewriting your history. Mm -hmm. This is why this rule exists. If you are rewriting history locally, awesome. If you've never pushed that commit anywhere else and no one else has ever worked on that branch, you're in the clear. Rebase it all you want, squash all you want. Squish them down to one commit so it says, I made these changes. I didn't make 40 commits and make a bunch of typos along the way. Uh, I didn't update my get ignore file 50 times. Uh, yeah. Um, that's a great idea. Let's clean up our histories, make it beautifully simple and clear. That, okay, update fixes this issue, changes these three files. See this ticket for reference versus here's 18 commits all with one or two character changes. Oh, I misspelled that. Forgot that dang semicolon. Yes, great. As soon as you push a branch and someone else could possibly work on it, do not rebase. That is the simple, clear, true uh, thing. This line here, this is directly copy paste from the pro Git book. You will be scorned by friends and family. <laughs> this is not me being clever. This is the book telling you this. We don't talk to Uncle Steve anymore. No. Rebase commits on a, on a multi-person branch. <gasps> Thanksgiving's got really messy uh, after uh, after that rebasing incident. Mm -hmm. um, if you rebase a single commit or a couple commits, we call that cherry picking. That's all cherry picking is, is you're rewriting history of one commit. Uh, it comes in really handy. Uh, in fact, if I didn't have an undo button when I used to get cracking client, I would be rebate, I would be cherry picking an awful lot because well, that's literally what happened with um, our friend from Curl. Uh, he wrote and pushed the wrong branch. Instead of writing to the new branch he made, he never actually checked out that branch. He could have, before he pushed, said, oh, I wrote this to master, uh, or to main, or production, I think this is called. I wrote this to, uh, to, to the wrong thing. All right, I'll just cherry pick it over here. Good to go. Um, Next is the dreaded merge conflict. The other thing I kind of want to peel back the, the covers on. Merge conflicts are terrifying. Again, I think because we encounter them, we're in a hurry. We have to get our work done. And now, oh my goodness, this didn't work. I challenge you next time you hit a merge conflict to fix it manually. And I'm not joking. Because Git is there to help you out. Git is the stupid content tracker. As soon as it can't figure out what to do, it just stops and gives up. Like, I don't know. But it doesn't do nothing. It, it does at least a little something to tell you. The thing it does to tell you is it doesn't actually 
allow those files to get added to the index. So all you got to do is run a get status and you'll have files that got added to the index and files that didn't. The files that didn't, there then lies your problem. Even if it didn't specifically tell you, hey, there's conflict in this file, it will just give you a quick list if you run get status. But it also will tell you when the, when the, when the thing happens. Then go look in the file. It's kind enough to tell you, hey, here's where head was pointing when you told me to do this. And here's the other branch. It's reality. The format is simple. Left pointing arrows, right pointing arrows, equal signs. Pick, one, pick the winner. Whatever the one you think, cool. Make it look like you want to. And then guess what? We're right back to normal Git flow. It's Git add, Git commit from there, and you're right back to good. And just to bring it back to your picture, just to bring it back to your picture, head to the left is pointing to here, and Mundo is pointing to the remote there. Another one of confusing terms is when they, instead of saying here and there, they wrote ours and theirs. So you can actually throw a flag <laughs> when you write a, uh, or when you do a, a git merge uh, with a X there strategy or an X, uh, X R strategy. Uh, I'm forgetting off the top of my head because it's very, it's 8, 30, 8, 12 evening at my time. I had a long day, um, but it's, there's a, you can just set the strategy and say, all right, which one do we take in case of a conflict? And it will prevent most conflicts. Uh, in fact, that's something we, I uh, can't force it right now, but there's, a, if we, if I could force the merge conflict tool and get cracking real quick, we actually have an X, uh, ours or theirs um, option. You can just direct, take from a drop down and say, all right, conflict, cool, fix it. Um, but also that's why get conf, merge conflict tools exist. As I'm saying, ch I challenge you by hand just to get the idea, but honestly, it's kind of a pain to do that every time. That's why tools like Git Kraken have these awesome merge conflict editors built in where it literally shows you there's ours and an option at the bottom to write your own. And then you just click the button, say, this is the one, apply it, great, we're back to commit, good. Everybody's happy. Looking at time here, I got time to get through this and everything else. Git config. Git config is, if you are reading the Git manual front to back, the place where everyone gives up. There are 3,800 I'm sorry, 38,500 words on the manual page for git commit or for git config. Sorry. Uh, go, go count them yourself right now. Go to the git dash SEM website, go to the git config page and count 38,500. Ironically, it's like the second thing everybody tells you to do after you've installed git. Install git, run at least the top two commands. And at this point, we probably should run in the third one to sell git that when you do a git init, call the first branch main instead of master. I don't know why they haven't fixed that in git yet. But anyway, you can fix that locally very, very easily. GitHub very, very easily. Um, but what does that actually do? It might take a minute for you to realize that, hey, this wrote to a hidden file on my home directory, specifically my home directory, git config. And that's where I store that stuff, just plain text. You can, go, you can go write this yourself. You don't need to use the git config command to do that. Global is why we know it told it to write to the home directory because global is the second thing that git loads. When you fire up git or you use git for a thing, it loads config from these five places. System, which most of the time is only gonna tell you information specific to your system. Uh, in my case, like my OSX keychain is uh, configured for, you know, SSH key reasons. Um, global, global is me in my home directory. It's everything I set, my color scheme, um, my aliases, everything that every time I use it, that's what I need to use. Local, that's what lives in your, uh, I guess I didn't put that slide in here. Uh, local, that's what lives in, well, what's local to Git? The Git folder. That's your deck. Um, dot git slash config. That's that file. Those are things like uh, the a branch, a which what remote goes to what branch, and all of those minutia of that particular uh, repo. However, you can actually go much further grain detail and set git config options for work tree and per blob, literally down to the blob level. 
nobody does that that I know of. I couldn't find a real actual example of why you would do those things in my quick research when I was putting together the slide, but you can. The thing is, Git overwrites anything at the higher level as soon as it loads the next level down. So if you set a different username and email and local, that's what your commits are going to be signed with. So if you want to have five different GitHub accounts, cool. Just set your username and pat or user not password, username and email in the .git slash config file instead of relying on it to be your global setting. Really quick, how do you get to those? These are the commands that you're going to get to those. So git config sys, uh, dash system dash dash uh, list will list your system level. Global will list your, list your global. Local will list your local. Uh, list show origin. Um, I'll just do it over here. Uh, I think I did it earlier. Yep. Um, magic of pushing up. Uh, git config <laughs> list show origin. This is what my git config looks like for git lens on my desktop. And here we can see that's where git is actually installed on my machine. And there's credential helper for, oh, so it's keychain. There's my info, uh, including my alias, git last, uh, which is really, really helpful. Everybody should probably have a last alias. Uh, I'll, I'll show that one. Um, uh, so git last, it just shows me the last commit. It's really, really practical. Um, uh, and then here, everything down in that list is specific to this this folder. So it's a really handy command to like quickly understand what's in there. So if something's like, I know I set that globally, why is this overriding it? That command will quickly get to the bottom of it. Like, oh, something sets it. Somebody set this at some point in the in the um, in the Git file itself. Maybe you did. Maybe somebody else. All right, time we got left. Then we'll move on to questions. One of the coolest commands, I think they built into it because it uses math in a really interesting way, uh, git bisect. It uses the power of having to find any commit in any repo of any size and under, I think 12 is the maximum number of steps you could possibly have. Um, so you say git, uh, git bisect start to start the program. They actually just updated this in git uh, 2.37, which was released yesterday, uh, or Monday, Monday. Um, so now it's no longer silent. It will actually say, hey, I'm running now. I'm waiting for you to tell me good or bad. Um, and then you tell it a good state and a bad state. Uh, most of the time you're going to be in a bad state. And that's why you're running it. So you're going to say get bisect bad and it will take head. And you say get bisect good and know exactly where. So you can say a specific commit. You can say a tag. Um, where, however, it, that's that commit-ish again. That uh, tag points to a specific commit. So that's commit-ish. And then it will jump to the middle of those two, have, literally bisect the, the, the graph, and then at, sit and wait. Like, all right, go look at this version. Is this, is this good or bad? And then you say, get bisect good. And it splits the graph again between good and bad. And all right, this is bad. Get bisect bad, then splits the graph again. And through the power of having, it's normally five to seven steps, no matter how big the repo is, to find where that bug was introduced, to find where that code was originally originally written. This works independent of commit messages. Good commit messages would obviate the need for this, but this is a lifesaver in the handful of situations you actually need to figure out where did this come from. Uh, Git work tree, last one, and then we will move on to things. So Git, by default, only lets you have one working set of thing at a time. It can only handle head pointing to one thing at a time because there's only one pointer called called head. But there's only one pointer called head per directory because again, we're not talking about files, we're talking about the file system. So it makes sense you can only have one branch open at a time because there's one file system that's trying to take care of. Git has this power called git work tree uh, or work trees, but the command is called work tree, where you can reassign branches to other folders on your computer. And now you've obviated that problem. You don't have the problem. We only deal with this one thing called the repository. Now main, that branch main, a copy of that lives out on, in this case, we'd move up a directory and then make a new folder called main. So it's living beside the repository. Same thing with feature one, same thing with feature two. And then to 
uh, oh, sorry. And then to check out any of these, you just change directory. So Git can have all of these open at once because they're not colliding because they're no longer in the exact same place. So Git's here can be here and here and here and here all at the same time because you are only going to reference it from here even though it's open here, here, and here. One of those confusing things. Why does this exist? Uh, this, is, this is how you use it. I'll let you read that. Um, this is one of those things until you try it, it you, you won't really, I think, uh, learn the commands. Um, but how many people have ever been in dependency hell of especially, you know, NPM world where I cannot stop. I cannot commit right now. I cannot stash this. I cannot, I, I can walk away from the computer and I can walk back, but that's all I can do. And we get that message on Slack. Uh oh, I have to drop everything and I have to fix this. Worktree exists. Get Worktree list, see what's actually truly, what's, what's already hanging off the tree. Most times it's gonna be nothing. It's just gonna be one thing and that's gonna be what your, your branch. Get Worktree add, add the path where you want it to be and name the branch at the end of it. Best practice, put it outside of your repo, somewhere outside of that repo so Git doesn't get confused. Do your work, work, work over there just like you normally would. When you're done, uh, clean up after yourself like you should with Git anyway with branches and get Worktree to remove that. So you, you can get in this weird state with Worktree and that's one of the downsides to it is that um, if you have try to check out a branch that's already checked out somewhere else, Git throws a really dumb error and it doesn't tell you anything. It's just like, I can't do that, but it doesn't tell you why, because it just doesn't. So clean up after yourself. But when you go back to change directory to the original thing where you were in dependency hell, it's exactly where you left off. It's like you walked away from the computer, used another computer to get access to the code, then came back to it. It's one of the most powerful features of Git. And for some reason, we don't talk about it that much. Maybe because it's tricky to use, but it's been there since 2015. This is under new feature. So uh, if we can dig into that a little bit. So, so let's say I have a repository. I have two branches, main and feature branch. And sure. I'm on feature branch. And uh-oh, there's something weird in here. So you're saying we can do get work tree to add some other folder above repo feature branch. Go over to that folder. And so if we work on that folder, and commit, hmm? how does that commit information get back to the folder that everything's under? It's a linked copy. Okay. So if we're working in main, or let's say we're working in main, the, the main here doesn't exist. We're just working in our repo. So let's say we're working in another branch inside the repo, a repo branch, cool, repo branch. And all right, now we got to we'll go over work in feature. Cool. Change directory. Now from a terminal, we're in feature branch one, completely different folder on the machine. From here, we say, okay, commit add. This is a linked copy that goes back to the Git folder inside of our repo. It writes everything as it normally would. This is a bit confusing, I realize, but this is another one of those places where you look at what head's doing and that's when head looks a little bit different and you start looking at the commits and they look a little, uh, uh, in logging looks a little bit different. It's one of those magic, this is one of those more black box things about it. Um, but it, I don't wanna say just trust me, this is, this is definitely testable. Um, with Git Lens, this is actually one of those features that they have, uh, one of the things they have to have set up for a Git, uh, Git Lens Plus account. Um, let's say I want to put main somewhere else, I will put it in my documents folder and uh, zooms in the way. I'm gonna move this. Um, then I can create a work tree in any of these strategies. So I'll say, uh, put it here, call it main still. I can't because I just called it the same thing, didn't I? That's dumb. That was my fault. Not, not that's user error. Actually, get trees already worked out, didn't it? Dang it. All right. Create a work tree. We're gonna create main. We're gonna put it here, we'll select it. And this time we're gonna say, put it here. Cool. That should work. Now, uh, quit, uh, get work tree list. Um, now I got two, two things going on. 
So if I do a get status here, I am on branch example, get bisect example. Uh, if I uh, change directory to that slash get one, no, dash dot dot, dot yeah, get one. I guess I have a lot of things called get ones, don't I? Documents, get ones, dot work trees. Helps if I add the L, doesn't it? Dot work trees slash main and do a get status here. Now I'm on main. Hmm. So if I go in and the uh, VI to my readme, uh, oh, I cannot type. All right, let's say I make a new file called read.m. Uh, say hello. I hope no one's watching this and judging my typing skills uh, at the end of the day. <laughs> um, uh, right, quit. Um, and do now I do a get status and now it's there. But if I uh, ch change directory back to get ones and do a get status over here, I mean, get bisect, nothing happened. Oh, interesting. Huh. I could, I could have also jumped through uh, the GUI to do that as well with get lines, but just wanted to show you in the command line. Right. That's very true. cool. Very cool. Um, so in conclusion, and we are right at time. Um, Dig into it. There is an awesome book called Pro Git Book. You can read it completely for free online. You can buy a hard copy if you really, really want one. They'll sell it to you on CD. Uh, last edition, second edition is 2014. It's a little out of date from some of the stuff like um, partial clones aren't in there. That's a pretty new concept. That's just GA um, ready for prime time now. Like the, they've added show and um, stash finally works right with it. That's where you can clone only you can clone just the commits, empty commits, but don't clone the trees and don't clone the don't clone the blobs. Only pull down the commit structure, and then only pull down the blobs when you need them. Super fast, super efficient. We're working the giant mono repo. It's called partial um, checkout, uh, partial clones, partial clones. This is pretty new to get, so check that out. But that's not even in the book. Um, uh, if you're working the giant repos, that's kind of a lifesaver. But I'm not going to talk about that. Uh, and the ultimate like. I just need help right now. Dang it, Git. This is the clean version of the other website that she runs, like Katie Sailor, Sailor Miller runs. Uh, but this is the one I tell everybody because it's the family friendly one. The other one has the uh, S word in it. Um, uh, and I don't want to swear on your, your podcast. No, um, you can swear. We, we swear oh, all the time. It's, it's oh shit, Git. Um, mm -hmm. com. Uh, but dang it, Git <laughs> is your, your quick reference. Um, there are literally hundreds of other books and things I can point to, but this is the authority for 90% of what you're ever going to need to know about Git. Uh, and this is going to get you out of jams nine times out of 10 where you backed in yourself into a corner with something. Um, actually didn't put the other slide I thought I had in here, uh, but that would have been just a generic list of other places where you could learn Git. But just type in learn Git and Git Kraken, and that will take you to our learn Git pages. We have wrote a bunch of them for you. Excellent. Fantastic. Yeah, thank you so much. This has been very, very, really ex insightful and definitely demystified some issues I've, or knowledge gaps I've had with Git. So I'm excited to go through the, was excited to go through the folder structure and see things like index and, and all that a little bit more deeply. Yeah. Um, it, it, the thing I always say with a caveat, of course, a little grain of salt, is you can't really break Git. Like you're not gonna break the CLI program Git on your machine by going and messing with your Git folder. You can blow up a Git repo, sure. You can totally screw up a Git repo by going and deleting things in the Git re in a, a .git folder. But that's one instance of a Git repo, not Git. You can't really break Git. Um, so I encourage everybody to go find an open source project. Git Lens is a good one download it and then just start messing around like figure and then watch what happens in git the first time you'll ever uh i hope we have enough time to do this uh go back to files go to head because i didn't demo this but this is this is one of the things that got me just dumb excited at one point in my life uh git branch it was like the first time i watched this so i'll check see main's already checked out and get bisects checked out but i'll check out insiders real quick 
Um, so I'm going to get check out. Actually, I use Switch. Switch is new. It's clear. It's way easier to explain to non-English speakers. Um, uh, it turns out I didn't know that, but I've had two different people from two different parts of the world tell me Switch makes more sense. Um, insiders, then check out. And also, there's a bunch of cruft with. Uh, did you see that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Watch, watch head up here. Not what I'm doing down here. So I'll get switch. And then if you throw the minus sign, uh, um, it will do the last thing. That's the entry of checkout as well. It's a, a bash thing. Bam. Rewrote. It rewrote that file just like that. That's all head does is just it keeps track of what's actively there. Um, like I say, there's this weirdness going on right now because we do have a work tree checked out with main. And it knows there's something weird there, but it's also not reflected in head. It's in here somewhere, somewhere, but I, it's in, it's this head. So hmm. other weirdness. All right. Excellent. Take us out, Chris. Oh, no, no, no. I was, I was just going to say, I, I can't wait to, to, uh, dive into that book and uh, and check and try bisect and work trees. That's that's two entirely new things that I, I didn't even know you could do. So um, that's uh, I'm I'm excited to just jump. Uh, hold on one second. I don't know how much more time we got. I could demo bisect, but I don't want to make this an all night event. No, I mean we can we can we can schedule another one uh, for for a set, for a different time. But it's, it's, we want. You know, it's, it's, well, how long would it take? I mean, I, I do want to see it. <laughs> All right, all right, let's just let's do it real quick. So that's actually why I'm in uh, uh, status. So I'm on a bicycle example. So um, I have, it's completely arbitrary uh, here. Um, oh, no, that's because I left that other thing. Let's do a get reset. Uh, get reset. Let's do hard. Auto complete, you're in my way. Okay. Come on. Tab. Got it. Get re Why did you show me the manual? Okay, it's gonna take forever because I don't know what. All right, so let's get reset. Hard. Okay, now we're back at the head. So if I look at um do, do, where did I write it? That's why I was over here, wasn't it? So testing. Read me. Here it is. No, nope, that's not it either. Okay, this would take forever because I'm not set up to do it. Okay, I apologize. Well, I can well, tell you where there, there, there is a, a video we I made about this. It's on the Get Cracking YouTube channel. It's actually a prepared example where I'm not fumbling around because I can't remember what state I left that repo in because I've been messing around with it the last couple of days. Mm -hmm. um, that that does show the example I was going to do. Cool. Okay. We can, we can definitely check it out there. <laughs> nice. All right. Well, um, Dwayne, thank you very much. We, we did, we went a little bit over time, but, um, this, this was awesome. We can trim um, that last part out where I was fumbling. No, 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 it's, it's okay. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll phase it in and phase it out. Um, and, and we're going to be seeing you again on V Brown bag. So, so, um, I'm excited, I'm excited to have you again for the, for the next show as well. But, uh, th thanks for coming on tonight. All right, man. Well, good stuff. I will uh, hopefully see you again soon. Well, I'll definitely see you in August again, but I'll look forward to hearing um, when this comes out and I'll be watching on Twitter. Wonderful. Thanks so much. All right. Thanks so much.